when Shimon Peres, in late 2001, said that their ignoring persistent requests for a ceasefire had risked turning the U.S. against us, Sharon yelled at him, Forget the Americans. We control them all. Yet, in his coma, Sharon could control no one. His sleeping and his waking were to merge. The pariah state's plotter-in-chief had lost the plot. And Karma had seen to it that his caging people in Palestinian ghettos had led to his being caged in a living tomb. After his death squad campaigns to Judaize the territories and his drive for a greater Israel, he had driven himself into a wall. Fate would see to it that Sharon, idiotically proclaimed a man of peace by U.S. President George W. Bush, was unable to kill anyone for eight years. Having darkened so many indigenous lives, lives of those he considered to be his inferiors, he condemned himself to an irreversible darkness. And then, eight years after his original stroke, he was summoned from his impotent limbo by death's grim angel. The judgment of an earthly court, the International Criminal Court, had been dodged and its scrutiny avoided. Israel may have the right to put others on trial, Sharon once boasted, adding, but certainly no one has the right to put the Jewish people and the state of Israel on trial. The obsequious cowardice of the international community had seen to it that this was the case. It saw that Sharon's revival of a racist state, long thought to have died out with Nazi Germany, was sacrosanct. And, irony of ironies, Sharon would refuse to allow Israel to ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention. Sharon insisted on retaining nerve gas as his loaded, lawless option for dealing with the Arabs whom he reviled. The drone ranger, Obama, said that he admired Sharon's dedication, and the UN's craven, Ban Ki-moon, described Sharon as a hero, making you wonder if they'd both have signed a condolence book when Hitler died. Tellingly, several of the living dead's leftovers, war criminals all, were drawn to Sharon's graveside, notably Blair, who'd also forced someone else's country to die. They'd both made fortunes from human suffering, Sharon from building his illegal, thieving settlements, and Blair from his laughable missions as a peace envoy to the Middle East, which, like Sharon, he'd played such a part in destroying through lying. This Laurel and Hardy of the living dead managed to make money, even in their sleep. Tony Blair stood by Sharon's coffin and bigged him up. He was a giant of this land, born of the union of a great spirit and a big heart. Let him take his place in the history of Israel with pride taking the grotesque beyond parody. Of country. Blair spoke of Sharon's supreme, supreme love, love of country, for the state of Israel, omitting the psychotic hyper-nationalism that spurred Sharon to build his is, mountain of corpses. For what it took to build Not to be outdone, the UK Premier David Cameron spoke of Sharon's brave decisions in pursuit of peace. A gaggle of brain-damaged warlords used doublespeak in their routine attempts to peddle war as peace. The US Vice President Biden declared Sharon an historic leader. Sharon was a complex man, about whom, as you've already heard from his colleagues, who engendered strong opinions from everyone.
and the Israeli Minister of Education said he was Israel's Moses. The minister promises that Israeli school children will be required to study the new Moses' achievements in their school curriculum. What exactly the minister expects the children to learn from Sharon's triumphalism at his killing 20,000 during his invasion of Lebanon, beggars belief. We will kill them, Sharon bragged to the US envoy, Maurice Draper, during the Sabra and Shatila massacres. We will kill them. He was unopposed. The first reporter to see Sharon's handiwork, Janet Lee Stevens, described children with their throats slit, a pregnant woman with her stomach chopped open, her eyes still wide open, her blackened face silently screaming in horror, countless babies and toddlers who had been stabbed or ripped apart and who had been thrown into garbage piles. I saw dead women, she wrote, in their houses, with their skirts up to their waists and their legs spread apart. Dozens of young men, shot after being lined up against an alley wall. And what did the Minister of Education imagine school children could learn from the transformation of Gaza by the Israeli Moses into the largest open-air prison camp in all history? Were they to be taught that, thanks to Sharon's evil antics, the ancient commandment brought down from Mount Sinai by the first Moses, namely, Thou shalt not kill, had now been superseded? And what did the minister think that children should learn from a man who deliberately provoke the Palestinians and would welcome their violent reactions to Israeli persecution? Because, perversely, Sharon knew that since Israel was stronger, he could do the Palestinians more harm in the context of war rather than the context of peace, which, of course, he never wanted. And what did the minister think that children could learn from the man who'd copied South Africa's Bantustans to create ghettos where Israel could practice an even more cruel system of apartheid, paving the way for Knesset members such as Danny Dannon and Miri Regev to describe African refugees in Israel as infiltrators and a cancer, and for others to persecute them and urge they be rounded up. Sharon's body is buried in stolen land in the Negev, but the Israeli coma continues. Thanks to America's life support, its existence is prolonged by dollar drips and transfusions of weaponry. More U.S. aid is given to this racist apology for a democratic country to whom child killing is de rigueur than to the whole of Africa. And, in its comatose state, Israel persuades itself that it owns another's country and that God is sympathetic to the security needs of a nuclear-armed Mediterranean poacher. Thus, inviting the Furies to declare open season on Israel's stiff-necked protagonists.